It's another Q&A edition of Optimal Health Daily, episode 860, and I'm Dr. Neil Malik. Hey there, happy Friday and welcome to November. This is where I really shine. This is like the in-between between Halloween and the holidays. This is my favorite time of year. Oh, and welcome to another Q&A edition of Optimal Health Daily, where I answer your health questions related to fitness, diet and nutrition, and lots more. You send me the questions and I answer them for you. Napoleon Hill once said that opinions are the cheapest commodity on earth. Everyone has their opinions. Whenever possible, I actually try not to share too much of my opinion when it comes to health-related information. Instead, I try and talk about what the data say, what researchers are finding. And so when I answer these Q&As, I do the same thing. Now, in case you're wondering, well, what makes you such an expert? I do have my Doctor of Public Health degree with an emphasis in chronic disease prevention and nutrition. I also have my Master of Public Health degree with an emphasis in health promotion and health education. I'm also a registered dietitian nutritionist, a certified health education specialist, and a certified exercise physiologist through the American College of Sports Medicine. Now, when I'm not doing this podcast, I hold now four faculty positions at various higher education institutions. I spend most of my time at California State University, San Bernardino, where I'm an assistant professor and where I teach nutrition classes. Besides that, I've been quoted in over 70 different media outlets for my expertise on wellness and fitness and nutrition and stress management and dieting and all of that fun stuff. And I've also published research when it comes to the effects of diet and weight management. But the most important thing is I love listening to and responding to your questions. So thank you so much for sending those in. And if I haven't responded to your question yet, I promise I will get to it. So with that, let's hear today's question as we optimize your life. Hi, Dr. Neil. I'm a huge fan of yours. My name is Gabriela, and I've already had three surgeries concerning kidney stones. My question is today is, what kind of diet could I have uh, to avoid getting more kidney stones aside from lowering my sodium and drinking water? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Gabriela. I'm so sorry to hear what you've had to go through. I'm glad you asked about the links between diet and kidney stones. Now, while kidney stones aren't completely preventable, there are certain dietary changes we can make that may help reduce our risk for developing them. I still remember a few years ago, one of my students came up to me after class one day and was complaining of pain in his lower back and vomiting. But he was most concerned about the fact that he noticed there was some blood in his urine. I first told him that he needed to go to the emergency room immediately. And because I'm not a medical doctor, I reminded him I couldn't diagnose him. But I did suspect one of three things, a kidney infection, a urinary tract infection, or kidney stones. None of these conditions aren't great news for anyone. So it would be hard to root for one diagnosis over the other. But luckily he was okay. He did come back a week later and said he was diagnosed with kidney stones. So what exactly are kidney stones? They're actually kind of like little stones or pebbles that form in your kidneys. Now you may be wondering, how is it possible that our bodies actually form these little pebbles or stones? Well, have you ever seen real limestone or have heard what it's made of? Limestone is in part made of calcium. And it turns out kidney stones are also made of calcium. A good portion of limestone is made of something called calcium carbonate. The most common type of kidney stone is made of something called calcium oxalate. So you can see that stones we would find in nature, like on a stroll through the woods, are actually made of compounds very similar to kidney stones. So where would the calcium in calcium oxalate kidney stones come from? Well, calcium is one of the most abundant minerals in the body. Our bones are made mostly of calcium. Plus, we get calcium from some of the foods we eat, like dairy products. Okay, then, so where does the oxalate come from? Oxalate is actually a natural byproduct of our metabolism. What that means is the body naturally creates oxalate after it processes the foods we eat and uses them for energy. So having some oxalate floating around in the bloodstream is very normal. But we don't want that oxalate to hang around for too long, so the body does try to get rid of it. One way to get rid of oxalate is through the urine. So, oxalate gets sent from the bloodstream to the kidneys so that it can get sent out of the body via the urine. But you know what else is found in the bloodstream and just so happens to love oxalate? You guessed it, calcium. 
Calcium loves attaching itself to oxalate. It's obsessed with oxalate. Actually, the feelings are mutual. Oxalate loves calcium too. And when those two find each other in the bloodstream and get together, they cause trouble. That's because when calcium binds to oxalate, you now have this little mass or stone that forms. And you know where their favorite hangout is? The kidneys. So these two find themselves hanging around the kidneys, find each other, and form a bond, creating a little kidney stone. Luckily, there are things we can do to help reduce the chances of calcium and oxalate finding each other. And luckily, many of these are within our control. Now, as you mentioned, Gabriela, staying hydrated is important. But why? Well, we can reduce the chances of calcium and oxalate hooking up when we are adequately hydrated. This is because it makes it a bit more difficult for calcium and oxalate to find each other that way. You also mentioned reducing salt or sodium intake. You may wonder, well, what the heck does salt have to do with calcium oxalate kidney stones? Turns out, consuming too much salt actually increases the amount of calcium in your kidneys. So if you increase the calcium in your kidneys by consuming too much sodium, it makes it more likely for those oxalates to find calcium and bind to it. Now, luckily, there are other ways to reduce your risk for developing kidney stones. So here are five more diet tips to do that. One, reduce soda consumption. That's because sodas are often a good source of a specific type of sugar, sucrose. Large studies have found that sucrose may increase a person's risk for developing kidney stones. Next, substitute animal proteins like meat and chicken for vegetable proteins like beans. Beans are a good source of something called phytate. Phytate, or phytic acid, same thing, is a type of antioxidant found in most plant-based foods like beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. And phytate may prevent kidney stones because it tends to block the absorption of calcium in the bloodstream. So if there's less calcium in the bloodstream, then less calcium will end up in the kidneys. Less calcium in the kidneys means there's less of a chance that oxalate will find it. Researchers are also finding that consuming more vitamin C-rich foods can help reduce the risk for developing kidney stones. Vitamin C, which of course is found in abundance in citrus fruits, but also green leafy vegetables and even strawberries, vitamin C may help the body remove oxalate from the blood. So that's why vitamin C might be helpful. Oh, and speaking of things that may help remove oxalate from the blood, researchers are discovering that magnesium may do the same thing. So if we consume more magnesium-rich foods like nuts and seeds, you may actually help block oxalate from getting into the bloodstream. Again, less oxalate in the bloodstream means there's less of a chance that calcium will find it. And finally, consume foods that are high in potassium. Potassium helps reduce the risk of kidney stones by binding to calcium again before oxalate can find it. Potassium-rich foods would be things like bananas, of course, but potatoes, green leafy vegetables like spinach, along with watermelon and lentils. So when we think about the list I just shared with you, the common theme seems to be to increase consumption of plant foods. This is because they are rich sources of the vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants that may help reduce our risk for developing kidney stones. Oh, and I always say, please speak with your healthcare professional before following any of this advice. That's because recurrent kidney stones could be a sign of another underlying condition. Thank you again for the question, Gabriela. You'll be entered into a very small raffle every month to win a book. And if you want to be in the raffle, send me a question. Just come by oldpodcast.com slash ask. You can record right from your computer's microphone. It's really easy and you can even play back your message and do retakes before sending it in. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way and call in your question. The number is 61 I love ohd I can't believe it. That's 860 episodes of Optimal Health Daily and it's all thanks to you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing the show with someone. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you have a wonderful first weekend of November and I'll see you back here on Monday where your optimal life awaits.